Before I came to the Cleveland Clinic, I was in awe of the Cleveland Clinic. She has some very aggressive femoral disease. The first coronary bypass surgery was done here at the Cleveland Clinic. The first stop heart surgery was done here. We did the first larynx transplant. Then it led to the face transplant. Good morning, how are you? The clinic was really a pioneer in nursing leadership. She's COVID negative. It's not just about being first in something. It's having determination to endure the blowback of being iconoclastic. We are fearless, willing to try new things, innovative. But we believe we just have one mission, and that is patient care. All right, we'll take good care of you, OK? OK. Our mission has not really changed from the very inception of Cleveland Clinic. We're about to turn 100 years old, and our mission is about to turn 100 years old. The story of the Cleveland Clinic actually begins way before the clinic was started. The late 1800s, moving into the early 1900s, medicine in the United States was way behind how medicine was practiced in Europe. At the time, there were some very prominent individuals in the scientific and medical world in Cleveland. George Washington Cryle, he was a farm boy. He was born in Ohio, a small town down south, uh, hardworking. He graduated from Wooster College of Medicine, joined the practice of bunts and weed, the practice with buggies and horses and trauma, and weed up and died. And so Bunts and Kryle brought on one of Kryle's cousins, Lauer. These three surgeons were great surgeons. They were great academicians. They were great educators, so they were what we would call a triple threat. Fast forward to World War I, the first boots on the ground of United States soldiers were known as the Lakeside Unit, led by Dr. Kryle. And Kryle had an incredible role in organizing medical care. They faced incredible adversity. At one of the great battles of Ypres, they had 10,000 incoming casualties within 48 hours. At that time, medicine was practiced what I call mano a mano. You know, you had one doctor, one patient, and you didn't have a whole heck of a lot you could do for anybody. The partners, they were just three surgeons working together. But what they put together in this base hospital was what you see with the Cleveland Clinic. It wasn't just surgeons, it wasn't just physicians, it was a whole team. As the war ended, they said, this is the way to go. I want to do medicine the way we did here. Collaborative, to think and act as a unit. The three surgeons, when they came back to Cleveland after the war, they brought in the fourth partner. Phillips was his name. They would take their small partnership and explode it into this group practice. Cleveland, at that time, was a booming enterprise. It was one of the largest cities in the United States. It was one of the wealthiest cities. And so what they decided to do was to build an outpatient clinic, which is still here, which is still on our campus. It was in February of 1921 that the building was finished, right here down on Euclid Avenue. Things were really going very well. The clinic was bustling. There was growth. And in 1929, you know, the clinic almost came to an end. It was May 15th. It was a busy day at the clinic. There were hundreds of patients and caregivers in the outpatient facility. One of the maintenance workers was in the basement and there was an odd smell and some smoke. At that time, x-rays were stored on films made of nitrocellulose 
It's just a very volatile material. The x-ray started to ignite and emit this poison gas, and there was an explosion. And this gas started to emanate through all four floors of the building. People were overcome and literally died in their seats. That is still the greatest loss of life in American hospital history. The community of Cleveland came to this heroic rescue. And without the Cleveland philanthropic and volunteer support, there would be no Cleveland Clinic. And, you know, we've been relying on them ever since. We have a three-part mission from the very founding, research, education, and patient care. The founders knew that to take care of our patients, we needed to do research because we needed to know much, much more about the diseases and then understand how to treat them. In 1945, one of the best known researchers, Irvin Page, was hired into the clinic system to run the basic science labs. At the time, hypertension was a major health care problem. For reasons not yet fully understood, the arterioles may become chronically contracted, and this is the cause of chronic high blood pressure. Dr. Page discovered that the origins of blood pressure control were through a hormone produced by the kidney. Harriet Dunstan, I wish I had known her. She was the first to show that there was a renal artery cause for hypertension. And that was that the blood vessels going to the kidneys were narrowed and abnormal. And those patients suffered from the worst hypertension. These amazing discoveries led to a change in uh, life and death for patients with hypertension. She was a brilliant woman working with Paige at a time when most medical schools only admitted men. And the Cleveland Clinic is an amazing place because it saw the value of Harriet. She was a leader here. The most powerful chapter, I believe, in the history of cardiovascular care of Cleveland Clinic is the one that relates to Dr. Mason Sons and Dr. Renee Favalora. Coronary artery disease was big. It killed a lot of patients with heart attack. But we really didn't know how to take pictures of the coronary arteries back then. And Mason Sones did a lot of cardiac catheterization. Cardiac catheterizations were done it looked like a submarine. There was a man down in this pit, and he had this periscope, and a patient was above, and they had this dye that they would inject into the aorta, and they would just look at the heart and the valves. Dr. Sones, he injects, and to his horror, he sees this dye. They put it in the wrong place, and they look up on the monitor. The EKG has gone silent. The guy was still conscious, fading away, and Dr. Sones came up and shook him and said, cough. <laughs> Cardiac monitor goes into sinus. The first cardiologist to do a selective coronary arteriogram said, I think we're on to something. And it was also at that time that another very famous surgeon joined the clinic, Rene Favallaro. They were trying to figure out how to solve the problem of coronary artery obstruction. And so Favolaro took a vein and interposed it to bypass uh, the obstruction in the coronary artery. And so bang, this was the second great discovery. And it's the basis really for contemporary cardiology. Things evolved at the Cleveland Clinic and heart care, and we started looking at new devices, new operations, new valves, and one of the early people to run our research uh, institute was Bernadine Healy. The effect that Bernadine Healy had on research, you can't match it. She was the first female director of research at the Cleveland Clinic. 
She really uh, wanted it to be known that women had heart disease too. And women's cardiovascular risk and disease is quite different. And research on people was only done on men. If you wanted to study women, you recruited men and you administered female hormones. This is happening in the 1980s. She said, that's nonsense. And she mandated that if you're gonna do clinical studies, you need to include women. Audacious, right? The research very early on was pushed by curiosity, by necessity, by innovation, and that spirit has been legendary right up until today. We just did our 2,000th heart transplant, and we've done 2,000 lung transplants. There's not too many programs in the world that has reached those marks. The lineage of transplantation here at the Cleveland Clinic goes all the way back to the concepts that were batted around with George Crow with respect to blood transfusion. If our founders showed up today, they would be extremely pleased because what they would see is that we were still true to our founders' beliefs. The foundation of Cleveland Clinic as a group practice that was put in place 100 years ago is alive and well. In the early 2000s, our CEO, Toby Cosgrove, created institute models combining various departments into teams that work together. And so there's no competition between, say, the vascular surgeons and cardiologists, but instead they work together and share their knowledge and insights to deliver the best possible care for patients. We'll get you out of here, okay? I think the most important thing and the thing that will guide us through all this is the fact that we can't lose sight of our main objective as our patients. No matter what you do in our organization, again, each of you can contribute in your own unique and special way. It was a great day. I appreciate you. In 2008, we established a nursing caregiver institute and then the Office of Patient Experience to really examine what our patients need and the experience that they have in our organization. We believe that we have a responsibility to touch as many lives in the United States and worldwide as we can with the type of care that we know how to provide. But Cleveland, of course, is our hometown. We're a very unique city, hardworking, accomplished. That word, grit, captures it all. We have a responsibility to set the bar for excellence in healthcare and everything that we do, in particular when it comes to our underserved communities. You will come back? Absolutely. We work closely with our civic leaders to meet the needs of the people who matter most, and that is our community and our patients. So surgery went very well. Take a deep breath. I think all of these things that we're doing, it's like a domino effect. One thing makes another thing better. We're not the same old Cleveland Clinic, but we're the same old Cleveland Clinic. I cannot stop to marvel on a collective wisdom of our founding fathers. You can feel it in everything that is being done here at Cleveland Clinic. And I'm absolutely certain that we're going to continue with the success in the next hundred years.